Got you. Hey, I hear you. Uh, okay, you can hear me all right. Yep. All right. Share screen. Let me get my PowerPoint up and then. Ding. This is so easy. <laughs> it's brilliant. It is. So, uh, we have right. um, 13 participants in the webinar and we'll give it a few more minutes for people to get logged on and then I'm sure a bunch of will start coming in and then we'll uh, we'll get going here. So if you're in the audience, uh, just bear with us and uh, give us a few minutes to get a few more folks logged on and then we'll we'll get started. Okay, it is five o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening to everyone. We would like to welcome you to our webinar this evening about chronic progressive lymphedemia, also referred to very often as CPL, presented by Rebecca Blentoff. This webinar was organized by the Fauna Education Committee and is being brought to you by the Fenway Foundation for Frisian Horses. We are recording the webinar tonight and we will have it posted in our library in the next few days. Um, it is possible that you may experience some latency issues with your broadcast, depending on the strength of the internet at your location. So I just wanna mention that in case you have some lag time. Unfortunately, that's nothing that we can fix on our end. Um, that's a reflection of your individual network and the strength of the internet signal where you're located. So we do suggest that if you're having an issue with latency that you just do an internet speed test. Um, so that way, future broadcasts, you can kind of have a better idea of what to expect as far as the quality. We do have a large audience with us tonight. Um, we will try to get everyone, um, all your questions in. For now, you'll be in listen only mode. Um, so. Throughout the presentation, we'll stop periodically to see if there are any questions of Rebecca. And so you can submit your questions in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen toolbar. So if you can see that down there, you can just click on that and type your question in there and I'll pull your question and ask Rebecca. Um, so now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Rebecca and I think uh, we are ready to go. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Rebecca Blantoft and um, it's really lovely to be here today. And um, we're going to do this presentation in two parts. So half of it um, today and then half of it at the, at the next date. And this, um, this presentation will cover basically learning about the lymphatic system. So um, looking at at all of the different facets that make up the lymphatic system and how it works and some of the interesting facts about it because it's a it's a system that's just completely kind of ignored or, or, or not really fully understood everybody understands how a heart pumps or how a muscle works but the lymphatics is a sort of elephant in the room and we don't ever talk about it and we don't learn about it but if we do learn about it we can have a much better understanding about what happens when it goes wrong and what to do when we treat it um, so this um, part part one I'm going to call it um, will cover you know the sort of 
the biology of the lymphatic system and what it does. And then the next part, we'll, we'll um, look at some um, cases of what we do um, when a, a case of lymphedema or chronic progressive lymphedema comes into clinic, what are the options? How do we assess them? How do we treat them? Um, and all of the different treat, treatment protocols. So if we um, keep those kind of questions for the next session, they will be answered. So we'll, we'll try and stick with this biology first. Um, now, we do have quite a lot of human pictures, and this is because... Um, we don't have a lot in horses um, and the diagrams are mainly you know from human biology books so it'll seem like it's a little bit biased to, to human biology but actually it'll, it'll all make sense at the end um, so hopefully you'll enjoy yourselves and um, I'll start away at the end of every slide I'll just touch base with Angie and see whether she wants um, whether anybody has, has sent in a question and I should do my best to answer so get your questions ready and um, hopefully we'll all enjoy this session so um oh so a bit about me first so um I, I went and studied um, human lymphology at the Vodder Academy in Austria, um, which is probably one of the best training places for um, the treatment of lymphedema in humans. Um, and their courses are very good in the sense that um, they, they're very, very wide ranging. So they're very, very progressive in Austria and Germany. They'll be treating all manner of things with um, manual lymph drainage. They'll be treating um, tremors in Parkinson's patients and poorly healing fractures and also um, incredible stuff. They're even repigmenting scar tissue using the technique. Um, and then um, sort of thought, well, you know, for my own interest, I treated a few horses with um, injuries actually and hematomas and um, wrote up an article saying that, you know, you can use um, lymph drainage for the treatment of hematoma in horses. And um, and was picked up in Germany by um, Professor Rautenfeld, who I believe is now retired or retiring from the University of Hanover, who spent the, his life looking at the equine lymphatic system and encouraging PhD students to carry on research in the area, which is hugely underfunded and we need a lot more research. Um, and then um, I started treating horses, but realized there were no products to really help them. And if there were products, they had some problems with them. So um, I thought, well, you know, we really do need to look at this and address it and give something that's trustworthy and med medically correct as a, as a product for people to use. I didn't really expect very much to happen. And I didn't really expect very many people to be interested in lymphatics and horses, to be honest. Um, but being a lifetime horse owner and horse rider was always something that was quite interested. Um, I ran a private practice for 15 years um, and then ran down my uh, human practice. Now I'm pretty, I, I just treat horses exclusively now um, through the UK and um, formed Equilymph as a company to um, design um, diagnostics uh, and treatment protocol um, systems for vets. Um, and also products for people to be able to use on their horses for all the varying stages of the disease, which is sort of quite challenging. But anyway, we've, we've, we've sort of done it now, which is great. Um, so that's me. Um, and I'm basically um, based in Oxfordshire, which is the middle of the UK, um, and travel all the time. <laughs> basically live in my car. Um, so uh, uh, driving around, looking at horses, I... Um, one of the group experts on the um, CPL Facebook page. So you, some of you may have seen my name there and, and hopefully I've responded promptly to your questions and queries. Um, if, if you need me, tag me. <laughs> and I will try to get back to you as quickly as I can. Right, so if we start off with the lymphatic system, it is a fantastic system. So all of us will be aware of what the cardiovascular system does. So we know that we have this heart and it pumps and you've got this wonderful oxygenated blood, which is shown up as red on the diagram. And the heart pumps this beautiful arterial blood 
out. Now this is full of oxygen and nutrients. Okay, so it goes through big arteries, smaller arteries, smaller arteries, smaller arteries, and then at microcirculation level, your arteries have semi-permeable bits in, in them. And basically everything that's in the blood that's not red splurts out of the artery, and then it filters around into the tissue spaces. So if you think of that as a washing up bowl, and you imagine that your cells are little ping pong balls in there, and what you've got is a pipe pumping oxygen and nutrients into this washing up bowl. And that allows the ping pong balls to pick up all of the oxygen and nutrient they need to stay healthy, okay? So then part of the cardiovascular system obviously is Obviously, if the arterial blood goes in, how are you going to take it away? And obviously, the cardiovascular system will take it away through the veins. So the veins will start taking some of the, the smaller stuff, the serum through, and it will return it all the way back um, to the heart and lungs, where the lungs will reoxygenate it and the heart will pump it back up. So it's a kind of like a closed system. So what happens, so this is, is in um, figure A, you can see the sort of heart and lungs and they pump through, but where the hell does the lymphatic system sit? Well, if you go back to this washing up bowl, of course there's a massive amount of debris in there. There's a lot of big stuff, dead skin, dead cells, uh, white blood cells from fighting infection, um, you know, all sorts, protein and the, the, the big heavy kind of stuff. Now the veins can't take this because the veins, if you think of them as just, you know, little straws, they haven't got any filters. You know, you don't want any nasties going around in there because it will go around the whole system and make you really ill. So if you imagine you're washing up bowl, you've got your lymphatic vessels sitting in the washing up bowl and they are pulling up all of the big stuff. Um, you know, all of the nasties, all of the things that need to be filtered. And then these will run in a series of pipes, one-way pipes all the way through. If you sort of follow figure A, you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a big round green thing, which is a lymph node. The lymph will pass into the lymph node, which we'll go on more about in, in, in later slides. And then it, it'll filter all of the lymph. And then just um, what happens when it's all beautifully clean and it's safe to go back into the cardiovascular system, the lymph will, will, will flow into a vein and in a human it's our subclavian vein and in a horse it's um, the external jugular veins. It'll drip into that vein and then that vein will go to the heart and lungs and reoxygenate. So if you think of the cardiovascular system as a, you know, everything going out through the arteries and back through the veins, and then you think anything that's getting stodgy at the bottom is getting lifted out and filtered by the lymphatic system. So it's basically just um, a sewage system, really. Um, but you know, and, but it's great. You know, if we if we didn't if we didn't have this, we would die. Um, you know, and it's going on all the time. You know, when we're asleep or when we're awake, and it's just normally happening, and nobody ever thinks about it because it hardly ever goes wrong. So. Um, it filters about, in a human, about two to four litres of lymph um, back into the blood a day, about 75 to 200 grams of protein every 24 hours. And depending on the size of the horse, you can pretty much quadruple or times that by six. So there's a lot of fluid. And if you think about the vessels being, you know, you just take two hairs, three hairs on your head, that's the size of one of the biggest lymphatic vessels in your body. And so when you think, wow, you know, you've got six of those in a leg, and they're taking, you know, a, a litre a day, it's quite a lot. They are quite active, much more active than you'd think. Um, they sort of sit in various regions of the body, these lymph vessels, and we'll talk about the, soup, the deep system and the superficial system. And then we've got sort of lots and lots of lymph nodes. So we've got in humans probably about six to 800 um, a third of which sit between our sort of um, neck and collarbone. There's quite a lot there um, because the return point is here. So it needs to be filtered really well. Um, and horses have a lot more as we'll go into a bit later. And so the lymph, um, the stuff that the lymphatic system is taking and transporting around the body are things like protein, 
um, cell waste, foreign substances, long chain fatty acids, salts, sugars, vitamins, minerals, and hormones and lactic acid to a degree. Um, so it's quite a busy little system. And um, without it, um, you know, we'd literally become extremely toxic <laughs> very, very quickly. Uh, we wouldn't be able to expel, um, you know, all of the sort of catabolic waste products as a, as a by result of our metabolism. So have we got any questions so far? Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, and, and if these are more appropriate for other slides, we can hold them. But um, first question is from Kate. She wants to know if a horse has a compromised cardiovascular system, does that, you know, if it, essentially she's asking if they have heart problem or a weaker heart or don't pump blood as well, does that have a detrimental effect on the lymphatic system? Kate, okay, this is a great, really, really great question. I love answering this one. So, and it's great that you that you've asked this. Yes, and and in humans we have a massive problem with this. Um, so, people, humans with heart failure, no lymphatic problem at all, uh, but where where the where the heart isn't strong enough to pump and return, people in heart failure will often get a lot of swelling. But this is um, related to the cardiovascular system failing. And these are quite difficult to treat um, because if they get lymphedema or lymphatic disease as well, they have an awful lot of fluid there. And we have to be very, very careful when we treat them, if we can treat them, because if you're pushing, not only, not only are they struggling to get the the venous return that the the vein you know the veins are struggling to return things back up to the heart and lungs um but also if you've got the lymphatics trying to do that too you can overload the um what we call the, the cardiac preload which is the amount of fluid that the heart and lungs can actually cope with and so if you've got a uh, um, heart failure and lymphatic disease it's a re it's, it's really difficult to treat and you have to you, you know you you have to really know what you're doing and you, and in fact in in late in late cases of heart failure you actually you know often contraindicated and you can't treat the lymphatic disease because all of the lymph that you're pushing up to the vein will you know will overload that part the vein part of the system in horses they tend not to get heart failure like we do um you know they tend to they tend to either be dead or alive with heart issues which is <laughs> swings around a, bit, a little bit of a pro and a con really they tend their their vessels are, are formed quite differently so they can tend to they don't tend to get vein failure like we do and and they tend to if they have cardiovascular problems um you know they yeah. They, they tend not to be as, as, as varied type of cardiovascular problems as we do, but it's certainly something that we watch out for. Um, and, you know, severe heart murmurs, uh, for example, um, you know, would be, would be, you know, one of these things that you'd think, oh, okay, right, well, we, we might need to adjust treatment accordingly to make sure that we're not pushing too much fluid um, from the veins and lymphatics towards the heart and having a problem with that. But usually with a horse with a heart problem, you'd have you'd figured that out because you'd be having problem riding the <laughs> riding them to start with. So you, you'd kind of be under control in that way. And so I hope that's answered the question. Yeah, I think that's incredibly thorough. Um, Margot's question is the last I have at the moment. And she and this is a very common question, I think. Um, her question is since we tend to see CPL in larger horses like draft horses how does that correlate to the lymphatic system size? Does it have anything to do with the size of their heart or the size of the lymphatic system? No, this is something that I'll cover very quickly just now, but um, it'll come up in later slides. But basically the, the, the difficulty with, with what we've done to horses is we as humans have grown them too big. Um, they, from an evolutionary perspective, they still believe that they're the height of a Great Dane um, and, and, and their lymphatic system thinks it is quite, is, is like that. The vessels have have obviously elongated to, to cope with the fact that our horses are bigger and heavier but they aren't great <laughs> they yeah we're, we it's it's our fault we, we we push them down an evolutionary line in a way too fast and grew them too big and yeah the, the, there are issues with this and, and we'll go on on to that subject in more depth later on but it, it's an absolutely 
you're correct. It, it is an absolutely spot on question and, and completely right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, right. Any more, Angie? We're okay? No, that's it for now. Okay, right. So when we start to listen to um, talk about the lymphatic system, let me just check I haven't lost a slide here. Right, okay. Um, when we start talking about the, the lymphatic system, we have to um, just understand the difference between what we call the deep lymphatic system and the superficial. Okay, so the reason why we make a distinction is because the two kind of run together, but separately. So it's almost like having one layer. So you imagine that, I'll pretend <laughs> that this is a, a drain and you've got, you know, the deep system sitting here all draining to this drain. And you also have the superficial system there as well, all draining to the same drain, okay? Now they can send lymph between the superficial and the deep bouncing between my two hands, but both of those areas will drain to the same um, vessels, okay? And we'll go into that in, the, in, in a little bit late further on. So all you have to remember, just to make it simple, because there are some very, very complicated diagrams here, which you really don't need to know. Um, they just end up very confusing, even to people like me who've worked in this area for a very long time. Um, the deep vessels are basically everything under the skin. OK, so we're talking about, um, you know, our organs, our brain, our, our, our bones, um, everything underneath our skin. And the deep system has much larger vessels. And that's where all the lymph nodes are. And we also have lymphatic, what we call lymphatic organs, which are the bone marrow and the thymus and spleen. We've got the largest vessel um, of, the, of the deep lymphatic system, which runs up our spine, same in horses. It will run up the spine. It's called the thoracic duct. It's probably a little bit smaller than this pencil. Um, and um, basically, um, these vessels get larger as they approach um, lymph um, ducts. So, you know, big thoracic duct here basically means that as the lymph, the lymph, the, the deep vessels are quite small here, and as they go towards the thoracic duct, they tend to widen as they go into the big duct. Okay, so everything underneath the skin is draining in very specific routes all the way up the thoracic duct and back to our return points, which in, as I say, in humans are underneath our collarbone and subclavian vein, and in horses, it's the external jugular vein. So the superficial system um, is um, really, I love the superficial system the best because it's the skin, basically. It's, um, the skin is our biggest organ. And if you think about, you know, stuff that happens to us in our life, we're pretty much guaranteed to cut ourselves, graze our knee, um, you know, do all of that kind of stuff. And in horses, especially, uh, they're just big accidents waiting to happen, as we all know. And the skin needs to be able to sort of drain in its own way, because it's, it's really important from an immunological um, perspective to be able to do that. So what happens is you've got these cute little things that pop up like fingers in a glove. They're tiny, they're microscopic. And they're just there, they're called the initial lymphatic vessels and they're situated, situated in the epidermis and these little filaments will open and close and, all, and suck the lymph in, which is awesome. And then these little things um, join up to a deeper dermal plexus of pre-collectors and then they go to bigger collectors and they basically drain the skin and they work in what we call watersheds. So if you imagine a whole bunch of fields with ditches in between, and so, you know, one field floods with water, but it doesn't pass onto another boundary because you've got the little, you know, the little ditches that fill with water. And then the other side, you know, it's got ditches around it again. And that makes sense because if this gets over flooded and full of nasties, it means that the skin can kind of contain on itself and the nasties aren't gonna, you know, quickly flood into another area. So that's kind of, all you have to think of deep under the skin, superficial is the skin. That's kind of as simple as it gets, hopefully. <laughs> Have we got any questions about this one? No, no questions. But if you're in the audience and you've joined us late, if you have a question, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little uh, 
uh, text box that says Q and A. So just click on that and type your question in there, and I'll see it, and I will ask it when we get to a point where we're ready for questions. Right. I just suddenly realized that actually I should have gone into a little bit more detail on that last one. <clears throat> I want to show you a little bit more. If I go back to a previous slide, you'll be able to see. Yeah. If you look at B, that is an initial lymph vessel. And that is basically, you can see the little, um, the little green bits with the little kind of wavy um, black bits on. That is it, that these are the first things. These are like little fingers in a glove and how they work is really interesting. So when, if you go back to the washing up bowl analogy, you've got a lot of arterial blood floating in here. And when the pressure gets enough, it gently moves these little anchoring filaments and the anchoring filaments open. And then the, the interstitial fluid, the, the washing up bowl stuff, gets suctioned into the initial lymphatic vessel and then it closes again. So that's how it picks up all this waste material. But it's quite nice to know, I mean, these, these are absolutely tiny. You'd have to magnify them about 50 times to see them. And in fact, it was only through recent um, advances in uh, electron microscopy, you could actually see them move because they're, they're so small that you couldn't, you couldn't really see them move you could see them sort of you know stuck and and on a you know static bit of um you know my, um, on a microscope um slide but you couldn't actually see them opening and closing and for many years everyone was very very confused at how they actually did it they re they really didn't know um so they're they're one of the main things in in um, lymph drainage so in the deep system so we've got both systems draining away but both of them will always drain to a lymph node. So if you've got a territory of skin, as I said, you know, you've got your superficial and your deep, and they're both draining to the same channels. Now these channels all go to lymph nodes. These are probably the most important part of the lymphatic system. And they are basically, everyone sort of, sometimes people call them lymph ducts, but they're not, we really call them nodes. And what they are really is basically areas where things can get filtered that's really as simple as it gets they are just like a um an x-ray machine at an airport <laughs> you know you've got a big queue of bags needing to go through the x-ray machine you want to get them all nicely together and then they want to go through the x-ray machine where they're analyzed to make sure there's no horrible stuff in it if there's any horrible stuff the, the bag gets taken and dealt with and everything else just slowly goes through so the best analogy for a lymph node really is just thinking they are just like x-ray machines at airports so they have an immunological function, which means that if they do find any nasties in there, the, they can it mount an immune response. So we probably all know about T lymphocyte cells. These are our um, immune cells that go out and, and seek out and destroy um, pathogens in our body. And they are manufactured in the lymph node. Um, and they can also store harmful substances. So if you're unfortunate enough to work in the in an industry that uses oily, um, oily um, dyes, or if you smoke her, or if you live in a horrendously polluted area, um, or you had tuberculosis, for example, those um, substances come into the node they get analyzed and the body says, ah, yeah, I'm not really keen on this um, winging its way around the body. So they, they pop it up against the side of a node and then they'll grow a little kind of skin over it to encapsulate it against the wall of the node. So these are really, really interesting. And if you think about it, these are about the size of a grain of rice, um, sometimes a little smaller. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the size we're looking at. Um, and if you dissect into them um, heavy smokers, for example, you can see the encapsulated tar um, on the side of them. So, yeah, pollution and stuff like that can really affect your um, lymph vessels, which is quite interesting. So you'll see that there are a lot of, of, of little vessels coming into the lymph node at the bottom of the diagram, and those are called afferent vessels. Now, if you go back to the analogy of the of the um, 
x-ray machine. This is, you know, like everyone getting all of their bags ready to go through. Because there's no point throwing one bag through and then going off and having a cigarette and a coffee or whatever and then coming back because the x-ray machine is going to get really fed up with you. So you want to concentrate them all together. So the afferent vessels, there's always loads of them going in because it's pushing and pushing and pushing the lymph into the node. But there's usually only one efferent vessel coming out. And what does that tell you? It means that everything is getting super compacted in that node so basically it makes it much easier for the body to say is there any horribleness in here i don't know instead of having to just look at all of these bags coming through at different times you can compress them all together you can analyze them a lot faster now all of the weird things in there as well like the sinuses and stuff like that they just basically give shape to the node and stop them internally collapsing so you, you know you can't do and they they have some special functions around there but it's a, you know you don't really need to know that either but they are they are just fascinating and what's really awesomely cool about a node as well is you you can they can pretty much virtually 100 percent regenerate um so long as you have a, a an arterial supply a blood supply and a nerve just going to a tiny bunch of cells and you've taken the rest away, that lymph node can pretty much regenerate. It's in, it, it has incredible um, regenerative uh, capacity, which is really, really interesting. Um, okay, any, any um, yep. questions? Uh, I do have a, I have a question and we're, believe it or not, we've been going for 30 minutes. So I don't know. <laughs> I'll go faster. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question from Karen here and she would like to, uh, her question is, so when we have drainage out of the skin, is it from damage to the vessel allowing it into the lymphatic pathway or, or actually a break in the skin? She's saying if we see drainage coming out of the skin. Oh, if you is see a break in the skin or pouring out of right. the skin. So like if you have yeah. a horse that's it's draining some fluid yeah. in the leg. Yeah, that's called lymphorrhea. Um, and quite easy to kind of, it's a, I always think it is like, it's very similar to the word diarrhea actually and it is lymphorrhea. It's usually clear fluid coming out of the leg and usually sometimes quite, can be quite a lot. Um, what happens then is that you're getting backups. So the, the lymphatic system is one way. They've got valves that push one way. And then, um, y y so you know which way they're going, but sometimes the infection or, what, or, the, or the congestion from scar tissue, for example, gets so bad that the lymph can't get through and it starts to backflow back along the pipes. And then it comes back to those little initial initial lymphatic vessels in the skin and then it pushes the vessel up out of the skin and it opens and the lymph starts to pour out like that it's pressure and backflow that causes that so that's a is a good analogy for that like like when you have your pipes back up in your house and you now the fluid is coming out of the sink or whatever it is Perfect. yeah that's exactly it exactly that's a sign that there's a serious <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can cure it very quickly with compression and go in 24 hours. It's not something to ignore. Oh, God, no, no. And it's, actually, it's very dangerous uh, for two reasons. Um, the firstly is that the lymphatic system transports plants, um, transports protein into the blood. So if you're losing a lot of lymph, <clears throat> your, your blood protein level will be low and your horse could suffer from hypoproteinemia, which oh. is, again, dangerous. And the second thing is, if you have a lymph coming out of the leg, it's a site for secondary infection. So it's mm. a, you know you've got this. You can easily get a, another infection. So if you ever see lymphorrhea, uh, the vets sometimes un call it serum. It isn't. Um, you, they need to be under prophylactic antibiotic cover for sure okay. until it's until it's sorted out. But there are ways and means of sorting that out. And whoever asked that question. In the next session, if you ask that question again and tell you exactly how you treat that. Okay, sounds good. Okay. All right. Excellent. Okay, so we're going to race through these <laughs> <laughs> really quickly. So, you know, basically what the lymphatic system is there for, it's there to transport the lymph around. It's there um, linked to our immune system. It helps in the production of T lymphocytes to fight infection. It transports long chain fatty acids. 
it maintains the blood volume because of course it's taking fluid back into the blood. Uh -huh. um, it maintains what we call Starling's equilibrium and the health of the connective tissue. So going back to the uh, washing up bowl, of course, whatever comes in has got to come out. That's Starling's equilibrium in a nutshell. There's, it's much more complicated than that, but you don't need to know. And anything that goes wrong with it, obviously is going to lead to a swelling or one thing or the other. Um, and it's responsible, as I just said, for protein circulation, which is why lymphoma is dangerous because you're losing the protein. So those are the things that lymphatic system does. I'll whip onto the next slide and then we'll take questions at the next one. So what makes the lymph flow? So we know in the cardiovascular system, we've got a, no a lovely heart. It's really, really strong and it's pumping and that gives enough force for everything to move around the body. Lymphatic system doesn't have a heart. So how you have to think about it is a little sneaky, invisible hitchhiker. It's hitching a ride on anything that moves, wiggles and jiggles or pulses in your body. It's really clever. It's such a, it's, it's such a, a hidden system, but it's doing all these really, really clever things. So if you look at the illustration, you'll see that the, the, the sort of red parts are muscle. And then you can see a kind of in the middle um, of the pitch, you'll see a blue, bluey, purpley thing. That's an, an artery. And on the left hand side of that, you'll see little kind of bobbly, a bobbly little vessel that sits alongside it. So that's a lymph vessel. And you can see each of the uh, what we call angiums. So each of those little bobbly bits that look like little peas. If you imagine a necklace with, you know, one um, opening and then pumping and then filling up the next section and pumping and then filling up the next section and pumping that's how the lymph moves through these things and um the angians the little pumpy bits they have their own ability to pulse and pump a little bit not if if it was just that you probably wouldn't get enough to to make it move so it needs to hitchhike on other stuff so we've got the ability for it to contract but also it relies on the contraction of skeletal muscle. So when you've got a lymph vessel there and you've got muscle pumping about it, it helps the lymph move out of the vessel. The other thing that helps the, the um, lymph move is respiratory breathing. So we've got a massive diaphragm here. And if you're doing um, big diaphragmatic breathing, especially expirative breathing like this, the diaphragm moves down and it helps with negative interthoracic pressure for the lymph to come up the thoracic duct. And this is the same in horses. And the best pace for doing that is canter. Ah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing it does is it's a sneaky little system. It hitchhikes next to arteries. So this little illustration here is, illustrates this perfectly. There's the big fat artery and there's a little lymph vessel right next to it. Sometimes they share the same vascular lining even. I mean, you know, they, they're really close. So as the artery pulses, because they're really strong dynamic vessels, the little lymphatics can sort of, you know, take a little bit of a boogie off the side of that thing. And the other thing that the lymphatic system likes to do to, to hitchhike movement, is as your intestines are working and you've got the peristaltic action of the intestines, mm -hmm. the lymph vessels love that too, because they hitch a ride on that. So it's, um, it's got a little bit of pulsation, but basically it's hitching a ride off muscle, diaphragmatic breathing, pulsation of the blood vessels and the intestines, which goes to show, sadly, <laughs> if you want your lymphatics to be healthy, you do have to move around. Mm -hmm. And we do see this in elderly patients and especially also with horses with arthritis and not moving and old age, uh, lymphedema increases because the other intrinsic factors have lowered. So any questions on this part? Yeah, so that is actually the question and is how, detri <laughs> how detrimental is it to stall a horse? How detrimental is it to the lymphatic system or how much percentage wise approximately does it degrade it? It's a brilliant question. And the answer is a, a, a huge amount, um, a huge amount. They did tests at Hanover of healthy young horses. So horses between four and seven, horses that were you know, fairly active, fairly fit, fairly young. They injected dye into the lymphatic vessels and just made the horses stand because they were obviously sedated because they had to do an x-ray. Um, so just in the time that the horses were sedated and standing, 
they could see congestion around the bottom of the vessel. So lymph was already struggling to get in there. And those were young, healthy horses. What we go back to is exactly the same thing as we were saying before, that we've grown these horses too big. And what made the lymph pump, and we'll, carry, we'll, we'll cover this in part two, is that the, the, if you've got the hoof and the digital cushion and the band of fascia up here and the fetlock pumping, it is that fetlock pumping mechanism that helps to contract the lymph up the horse's leg. So when we're not moving them, they're all suboptimum. <laughs> and the amount of time and hours that they spend in the stable, I always say, think of it as an hourglass. You know, you've got a finite amount of sand. Every time they're standing, you turn that hourglass over and your sand is running out. You're degrading. You are degrading. You're changing the microcirculation. You are making your, your horse more prone to infection um, and, and lymphatic incompetence, really, to varying degrees. And the, the rate of which that progresses depends on the breed, how it's kept, how much it walks, how much it's stabled, and whether, you know, if you've got horses that just come in for five hours and, and then they're back out again, of course, the sand goes back up because you're, you know, mm -hmm. you see always in this balance with them. And yeah, yeah, we, we, we see a lot of it in, in, in race horses when they hit about nine, 10, because they're growing up in stables and they're doing a lot of their formative work and, and, and development stabled and we also see a lot of it in um in in warm bloods the big dressage horses again they spend a long time stable they're stabled all the time they just go into an indoor arena and then back into the stable again and and these horses are degrading fast we 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 don't have data on it but we know it's happening um we need more science yeah it's a good question we'll carry on with that in part in in, in the next part as well in more depth Jennifer doesn't have a question, but she has a comment. She says she's had lymphedemia in her legs for 15 years, and she 100% agrees that moving definitely helps. Yeah, it does. It does. It's a difficult, it's a difficult disease because we tend as humans to be very good with things that, you know, you can just run in and have surgery on. But when you're looking at chronic long-term conditions, it's they're, they're, they're hard because you've got to, you've got to manage that disease through, through the whole life. So that, that's really true. And we do see a lot, we see a lot of geriatric lymphedema, but we also see a lot of obesity related uh, lymphedema. So keeping weight down is, is really important as well. But we can carry on with that on yep. another thing. Okay, okay so, oop. right. So <clears throat> we now know the very basics of how this thing works. <laughs> um, so what happens when it starts to go wrong? That's what we're really interested in here. But at least you know the terminology now. So you know if I'm talking about, you know, superficial and deep and, you know, we kind of know where we are now. So basically, lymphedema happens when the lymphatic system can no longer, for whatever reason, um, can no longer transport the lymph effectively. OK, so think about it as a seesaw. So it's always kind of in stasis and it has what we call as a functional reserve. So it means that if you run up a hill and you're, you, know, you, you need a lot of oxygen to get your muscles going, you're, you're sending a lot of arterial blood into the muscles to give them you know, oxygen and nutrients to keep them going. The veins are doing their job. The lymphatic system, ooh, crikey, we've got a lot more work to do here, boys. And so they just, you know, they just, there's a little bit of, you know, reserve in there. You know, your lymphatic system will just increase a bit of pumping rate. And of course, you've got your muscles going and your breathing going and everything else is going. So everything just goes, OK, yeah, fine. We'll just deal with this. We'll just increase a bit and then we'll, we'll go back to normal again. That's absolutely fine. It's not a problem. But when, when the lymphobiligatory load, which is, if you imagine, like, um, if the lymphatic system can take, I don't know, 11 litres, as soon as that, I mean, and your body is coping with taking 11 litres a day, if it suddenly can't cope with 11 litres a day is when things start to go out of balance. And then you will find that the oedema will occur. Now, there are lots and lots and lots of different reasons for swelling. And as one lady um, said earlier, you know, heart disease will give you swollen legs vein failure will give you swollen legs kidney failure will go give you um, um, swollen legs um, starvation uh, children in africa with the very swollen bellies 
that's oedema, starvation oedema. Um, you know, so there are reasons why things swell, but we are only dealing with lymphatic swelling <laughs> here, okay? <laughs> if there's ever any doubt of, um, you know, a different kind of swelling, you, you know, this is a vet job, uh, you know, you don't diagnose other, other crazy diseases here. Um, but in lymphatics, when the lymphatic system is failing, you will get an oedema and it will be in a certain pattern, which we'll go into now. And the key point is, we say this is a protein rich oedema. None of the other oedemas that I've mentioned are protein rich. And the reason why lymphedema is a protein rich oedema is mainly just because the lymphatic system has to transport protein, okay? Which means that if it doesn't transport it, the protein sits behind in the washing up bowl. Make sense? Yep. Okay, questions on there or? No questions at the moment. Okay, good. Right. So, this thing is really annoying me here. It's really pishing a bit. Try your forward arrow on yeah. your forward. You should be able to control it. All right, it. okay. Thanks. There we are. So um, after we've looked at, we start to look at the disease and we think, okay, right. So we've got a swelling. We know it's a lymphatic problem. Then we have to think, okay, what type of lymphatic, what's caused it? Okay, so let's have a look and see whether it's what we call primary or secondary. And this is quite important and a massive distinction in horses. Okay, so primary basically means you're born with it. This is an inheritable condition, is caused by mutations in the genes responsible for the development of the lymphatic system. What is fascinating about the lymphatic system is when um, when babies are, are, are forming in utero, um, all lymph vessels start off as veins, and then certain substances affect them, like um, vascular endothelial growth factor B and all sorts of other things, which tend to make the cells differentiate and become lymphatic vessels. You can have genetic factors, which mean that those don't quite flip over from veins to lymphatics. Uh, you can also have slightly smaller lymph nodes so that the lymph can't get in there. You can be born with too few collector vessels, too many twisted up um, vessels or a complete absence of vessels. Um, so there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you've got primary lymphedema. And when, when we look at humans, they've really done massive work on, on, on looking at all the genes responsible for the different types of primary uh, lymphedema. So primary just basically means we've got a congenital thing. It's genetic. There's nothing you can do when that baby's born. It's in there. OK, and it's going to show up. We don't know when, but it'll show. <laughs> um, secondary means that you're born with a perfect lymphatic system. OK, and, you know, we're all chugging along and everything's fine and then things happen. So the most common cause of secondary lymphedema is cancer treatment. So um, mastectomy and um, axillary, axillary lymph node dissection from the of the armpit, um, pr uh, prostate cancer where they're dealing with inguinal nodes um, in the groin. Um, any other kind of surgery can trigger lymphedema because you're basically cutting across vessels. Um, infections will damage the vessel. So if you imagine an infection, if this mm -hmm. pencil is a lymphatic vessel, if the infection goes through it, it runs through the vessel and it leaves scar tissue, which can then fur up the, you know, the, the lymph vessels and cause them not to work. Uh, scar tissue or fibrosis, um, again, can cause lymphedema. Um, um, uh, it's interesting that if you have a cut uh, that's more than four millimeters thick, the lymph can't go through it. It will try and find a way around it, but it can't get through it. Now, often in horses, you can see a wire cut and you can think, aha, it might not be going through there. But sometimes you don't see any scar. You might just see that. But what's happened is you've had a puncture wound and it's all twisted up on the inside. So sometimes you, 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 know, you have to play a bit of a detective because you're not quite sure what's going on. Um, arthritis can be a problem. Um, a, a, an arthritis can cause lymphatic disease because you've got 
irritation, inflammation going on and off and on and off around a joint, that can affect the lymphatic vessels and scar them up and cause this. Um, venous disease, um, you know, if you've got your veins failing, the veins will leave swelling in your feet. But then what happens is that swelling is not meant to be there. So it starts drowning the lymph vessels as well. <laughs> you end up with a big problem. Um, obesity, a problem in horses and humans. Trauma and injury and also immobility. And again, this goes back to the question in the last one that, yeah, if you're not moving, your lymphatic system is not really working. And that's worse in horses than us. We are we'll going to the next section, but uh, the next um, session that we do. But um, yeah, horses suffer way worse. When we're sitting on the sofa watching TV or whatever, our lymphatic system is fairly constant. Whereas when a horse is stabled, they go to suboptimum, yeah, really quickly, wow. really quickly. Um, but we'll we'll go into more depth about that. Any questions about the difference between primary and secondary? Yeah, I've got one here, and the, the question is: um, Is there any research that tells us how much of CPL on horses is related to primary lymphedema versus secondary lymphedema? Right. Uh, CPL, you know, this is where we get an interesting um, problem. Uh, <laughs> in, hu in human lymphology, um, we, we, we differentiate primary, secondary, um, and we call all, well, both types, primary and secondary, is chronic and progressive. Chronic just means it's gone on for three months or longer. And it's likely to follow you for the rest of your life. That's all it means. Progressive means this thing's going to go downhill unless you do something. So technically, in human medicine, we don't even call it chronic progressive lymphedema. We just call it lymphedema, and it's either primary or secondary. Okay. Now, that's how it should have been in horses. But oh no, we someone just... wrote the text wrong when they published the paper, right? <laughs> yeah, I think they did. I think they just went, "Wow, this is chronic progressive lymphedema," and it's like, "Well, it's you should." Have... <laughs> yeah. So what's happened in horses, sadly, is horses do obviously get primary and secondary lymphedema. What we now call CPL is actually primary lymphedema. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's so, I've never heard anyone say that. That's very interesting. It is absolutely vital to know that because what happens is, of course, people will say it's got lymphedema, but you know, you think, right. So you've got to imagine, and I'll show you in the next session that we do, the difference between the primary lymphedema in horses, which is in the gypsy cobs and the Frisians and the Shire horses, mm -hmm. which is characterized by the skin thickening, the mites, mm -hmm. the nodules very 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 low fluid volumes hardly any fluid in that it's mainly a, a you know a, a sort of micro circulation and a, a collagen um, disposition problem um, whereas the secondaries when you've got horses with wire cuts like these guys oof, these are the presentations where you have one back leg that yeah, like a cellulitis lymph. after cellulitis and lymphangitis yeah. okay. these horses do not have an inherited problem these horses are getting it because they've either had any of these things surgery infection scar tissue arthritis blah 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 and immobility mm. that's what we're saying we're seeing it in these thoroughbreds coming off the track and we're seeing it in these dutch warm bloods these are the ones that have been immobile through their growing years and so that's left this mess and that's why they get infection. Now they don't develop the skin folds and the nodules. They don't have the problem with the mites, but mm -hmm. oh my God, they have a massive problem with a lot of fluid. They can lose the fur. They get a lot of lymphorrhea. And these guys are the ones that get stuck in chronic reinfection, 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 yeah. where they're euthanized at the end. If we could catch them, at an early stage, if we know that we're having a young horse and we're going to keep it in stables, if we compress them correctly, then they wouldn't have those problems later in life. And that is the God's honest truth. They suffer so badly. Um, and those are the two things. So in human medicine, you'd say they were the same. It's chronic, it's, it, you know, it's chronic, it's progressive. It doesn't matter. It's primary, it's secondary. They're both doing the same thing in horses. The vets change the terminology. Chronic progressive lymphedema or CPL is always the inherited one in the heavier 
horses with feather. And the secondary lymphedema is the one back leg that completely gets infected all the time. I see. But it's possible to have both. So you can you can have primary lymphedema in a horse where you've got skin folds and nodules in both legs, both both hind legs. And then let's say you get lymphangitis in one. Then you've damaged that leg through infection. So you've technically a primary with a secondary second presentation on top. So be careful with it because they can mix up a bit. It's really, really interesting. It's funny that you say that. And she's on the webinar. Debbie, if you're if you're listening, we had that discussion today. I think I think she showed me a, a picture of her horse that's suffering yeah. from that same issue. Yeah. Now I see them quite a bit, but then I that's my job. So but but you can yeah. always tell because it's in both hind legs, you see the skin folds and the thickening, and yet one leg is mm-hmm. much bigger and fatter. That okay. is that shows that it was a primary, but you got a big infection in one leg. Yeah. So then you would treat the the smaller leg the way you would a primary and you treat the second the other leg as you would a secondary <laughs> they gotcha. have different treatments yeah gotcha. yeah but to, for you guys to know this is so exciting to me because oh my god you know if you know this guys it's it's so empowering because you know what you're looking at and then you know by the end of the next time you'll know what to do mm-hmm. and you know we're, we're we're on our way aren't we you know that's what yeah. it's all about um any other questions with that that's one? it for now that was a great question yeah, it was good. We're getting great questions. Actually, I love all these questions. Actually, to be honest, I think I think the Americans have topped the world <laughs> stage here with questioning. Right, I'm going to put you at the top of the list. I'm really happy oh, with this. <laughs> yeah. <good> for us. <laughs> yeah. So okay, so um, coming up. So basically, then, so we've looked at the lymphedema. We know the difference. We've seen whether it's primary or secondary. What's going on, and then we grade it. <clears throat> so the disease, as we know, is progressive. So it's going to start here, and then it's going to go down. It's going to go down at different rates, depending on how you know what happens in that horse's lifestyle and how it's managed. Okay. Um, so basically, in humans, we we had four stages. Latent stage, which is the the lymphatic system is struggling and it's trying to do everything it can to make it stay in balance. So it's increasing pulsing action. It's trying to send lymph different ways and it's sort of going, oh, I can just about, I can just about keep me in balance, just about, just about. But what's happening is you're getting microscopic changes to the connective tissue and you're getting, you know, a little bit of sort of, you know, cellular immunity issues as well in there, even though you can't see anything yet. Now, this stage can go on your whole life. I could have that now. Not really, no, you know, it can just wibble along and there's no symptoms really, except in about. 20% of human patients, they will say, I've got a creepy feeling in my leg or feels like ants are there or like little tiny spasms. And I often wonder whether horses that box walk often might feel the same thing. I don't know. We don't know. We don't have enough research. Then in humans, you go into stage one lymphedema. Now, this is the person that gets up in the morning. We've had we've laid down. So gravity helps the lymph move they go oh yeah look at my feet they look great and then they stand up and they walk around all day and then they look at their feet and ankles and go geez you know my feet and ankles are a bit bigger but then they go to bed again and it spontaneously reverses it goes back um so this is you know you start to be able to see it um and in horses this there's no skin changes really at this time in horses at this stage this is the horse with stocked legs or is stocking up okay these are the ones that you know we tend to just think oh you know it's stocking up isn't a problem or we'll just walk it around it'll be gone well actually it is a problem you're in you're in stage one lymphedema now you've already exhausted your reserve in latent stage you're now getting a problem okay then it progresses to stage two where you know you go to sleep at night and your feet don't really go back to normal and you start to see all of the tissue changes and all of the things that start to happen there and then stage three is what we call lymphatic lymphatiasis, where you start to get massive you know skin the skin fold issues that we see in 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 horses so that was the human system so 
did the vets decide to keep the same system for horses? Oh, no, we know they did. <laughs> oh, no, they went and did another thing, and just to make things really complicated for everybody because you know, oh dear, <laughs> it's despair. not even numbers, right? <laughs> A B C D. I know. So this shows you, and you can do this on horses. I call this the press and stretch test that you can see in a, in a horse. But basically. If you take your finger and you're holding it flat and you're pressing pretty firmly, you know, don't be frightened of it and press and hold for five seconds quite firmly and then take your finger away. In a human, you will see a dent mark, which we call pitting oedema. And in a horse, you'll have to just run your finger over it like this. OK, then you'll feel a bump. And usually the best place to do that is, is sort of three quarters around the cannon bone, um, not on the bone and not on the tendons on the side, but sort of like. If the cannon bone's that shape, you're kind of aiming for there. Um, and you can't, it's very, very subtle in a horse. In a human, of course, you could push in quite far, but a horse you can't. So you're looking at a very shallow depression. As soon as you see that pitting, you can, all of you, honestly, put a ton of money on that because that's 100% a sign of lymphatic problem. And the reason why, going back to the washing up bowl, the lymphatic system's not taking away the waste. And so the whole area gets gunged up like oatmeal. And, and when it's like oatmeal, if you press into it, of course it's more solid and that's what's causing that. Um, so that's what happens. And that's a pure sign of lymphedema um, absolutely across the board. We do it with our hands and we do it with our eyes. We don't need anything else because it's it's just obvious to us. You know, that's how we're trained. We, we don't need to send people for x-rays or biopsies or anything. Um, you know, we, 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 we do this and, and all our hospitals across Europe are all diagnosed the same. This is how, how it's done. Um, then when it gets worse, <clears throat> stage two and three, you can start to see the skin folds happening, you can see the volume is going up and in the next picture you can see all the skin changes. So this is hyperkeratosis in a human leg and skin folds in a human leg and all of the things that we that we get. And they'll have also other problems like the horses will have with the hooves. So we'll get, you know, um, yellow nail disease and all sorts of other nasties going on in there. And humans tend to get a few more skin diseases and problems than horses do actually in a way. Horses were quite lucky that we've really only got hyperkeratosis and skin folds because there are some nasties in human lymphedema. Um, and then, yeah, so you then it, it just basically starts to just get worse and worse and worse um, until you're, you know, you're, you're just at this, at this terrible point. Um, so uh, any questions at those? Yeah, Carol asks, um, is that stage one press and stretch test something we might want to do with our horses when we just are doing our daily grooming, just check the legs to see how uh, our... Yeah, yeah. What I do, um, what I tell people to do is I tell them to take some volume measurements, which I can definitely show you how uh, in the next session. And then I say, look, you know, pick, so let's pretend that my arm is a um is a cannon is a cannon bone and imagine that my elbow is the who is the hoof so i would choose you know sort of like i don't know two inch points all the way up that cannon bone and i would press hold feel press hold feel and sometimes you can mainly feel some things at the bottom and then if you imagine when lymphedema starts it's quite fluidy and soft um so sort of like you know when you're just holding your finger normally and you press on this part of your thumb and then if you put your thumb against your index finger and push, it gets harder. And again, if you bring your thumb over to there, it's harder still. And if you can learn how to do that on your horse's leg, and then you just take a little note and say, do you know what? In January 2021, that felt like a one out of five to me, you know, with one being soft and five being as hard as, you know, pressing on a table. That tells you, what the quality of the tissue is. The other one that's really good and especially really useful for the horses with secondary lymphedema or anything that's had infection is, is the stretch test, where again, you just gently put your fingers on either side of your, um, of your arm and you're, you're not holding hard, you're just, you're just literally holding the skin and then you're just literally pushing the skin up as high as you can and down and you're just feeling the glide. You'll feel the glide of the skin 
going up and down on your muscles here and and you can also twist it like this now it's really interesting um if you have somebody help you do this um put your hand on the top and feel what it feels like to do this then get somebody to grab the under part of your arm and hold it <laughs> that obviously puts tension on you suddenly you think crikey that won't move at all so when you do that test all four legs because you'll often feel that when you put your hand just underneath the knee and the hock and you're pulling up you should see hair moving on the pastern and the that should feel about as bouncy as your forearm actually um, and you can feel it snapping back but when it's getting very congested it doesn't want to move and quite often there's a big difference between the front leg and a hind leg in in how it feels with that press and stretch, yeah. especially the stretch test and you can immediately start to feel the whole thing getting congested and it's quite nice then because then people have got a reliable guide if the four legs are feeling quite normal and moving and then they go to the hind leg, at least you think, right, I'm trying to get that hind leg to now be like a foreleg. And you can totally do that. You know, compression, safe compression will do that because over time it will improve the tissue quality and they'll normalize out. And it gives the owner a lovely thing because they know then, you know, hey, you know, it's all working and we're going the right direction. You know, the sand's going back up into the egg timer. Whereas if you feel the leg and the quality of the tissue is getting worse, then you think actually hang on a minute you know things aren't very well under the skin um they're getting you know real a lot of congestion problems and we've got to address that and that's something the vets always miss because they, they're just not looking at it great okie dokie uh, so onwards right i think we're almost there actually so lymphedema is not simple i hate to say i mean it kind of is simple i mean we Sometimes I wish that we had, um, you know, amazing surgical techniques or incredible, you know, super deluxe laser things and beeping <laughs> buttons and stuff. The truth is we don't. You know? we, we really have kind of basic stuff. And I think that's probably why people don't treat us very seriously. However, when you go into the when we go into the next section, you'll you'll realize actually, you know, to be honest, even though things like compression look simple, when you actually look at it in detail, you realize, oh my God, you know, this is an art and a science. There's a lot to this. And it and it is true, it's a lot harder than you think. You know, you think just because you've got like, you know, some non-elastic bandages and you put them over some padding, you think, oh, that's really easy, but actually there's a, there's a hell of a lot behind it. Um, so in a way we're sort of disadvantaged um, that we just don't have fantastically cool looking stuff you know we're <laughs> we're stuck we're stuck in the medieval period in some ways I hate to say but you know we always look at things and and you know in looking at horses as well you know no owner oh the owners you know we want to do the best we can for our horses but you know we, we're, we have constraints of our yards or the, the what I said you call them barns in America don't you the barns that you keep your horses in in you know little community of liveries or whatever or, or, or how how often your horse can go outside whether the horse has to come in in the winter because of the rain and the mud you know how much your horse is moving you're never going to be able to address it at all or if you can that's really lucky that's great here in the UK we've probably got less chance of doing that because we just a really small overpopulated island and we don't have enough room for us all sadly but um when you look at lymphedema you're always looking at it from a massive round perspective because um first of all you need to know exactly what's going on you've got to take medical history then you so so anything and you do you have arthritis yes okay oh do you have heart failure oh right okay that will that will have a massive impact on what you're allowed to do uh, to treat that horse or that person. Then you've got to figure out, you know, the oedema specific medically history to figure out whether it's primary or secondary, what the hell's going on. Then you've got to inspect them. You know, you're looking at the skin, the skin quality, you're, you're palpating all the tissue, you're looking for um, fibrosis, which is where everything sort of gunges up. Um, you're looking for any pain. Um, you'll see a thing there called stem sign, which is the... Um, if you imagine it's an, another test of lymphedema in humans, if that's your toe, you're looking at the next toe to your big toe and you're literally taking a skin fold like that. You're just squeezing the skin at the bottom of the toe and seeing how thick that skin fold is. And you know that if it's over three millimeters thick, you probably might have lymphedema because it's the area over the toe that starts to thicken up. Uh, you take your volume measurements, you look at the skin condition, 
If you've got chronic infections, you might take tissue cultures. Um, in humans, we do um, what's called um, a Doppler, or, or also known as an ankle brachial pressure index. And that's because uh, we don't do this in horses because they don't get this, hallelujah. But if you imagine that you have an artery and that's the bore of the artery and you've got blood rush, arterial blood pumping through, the arterial walls, now horses tend to just have arteries they don't they don't get um you know progressive heart disease you know like we do but we do we can get uh, what's known as arterial claudication or furring up of the arteries so you've got a whole load of gunk you know forming on the arteries and what happens then is that what happens is the bore technically becomes smaller because it's all gunged up inside then when i put compression on I'm squeezing that bore even smaller and that can cause not enough blood to reach the extremities or where it's going. Now that's dangerous because that's gangrene and you will actually like cause a massive problem and you might lose your leg. So we check uh, on humans, um, they do a special little test on the arteries around their feet and ankles to make sure that the arteries are thick and are, are, are good enough and clear enough to be able to handle compression. Luckily, we don't have to worry about that in horses. Then we have to look at all the comorbidities. Um, all of the things can affect it, you know, pregnancy, tuberculosis, arthritis, heart disease, kidney problems, liver problems, um, you know, all of these things have to be taken into effect. But out of all of the things on this page, and this goes the same with horses as well. The most important thing of the whole thing, patient compliance and a support network. If you have patients that get on top of it and they are literally going, right, I'm gonna bung this into my general routine. I'm gonna clip the legs. I'm gonna look at them. I'm gonna be on top of my skincare. I'm gonna be on top of my wound care. And I'm gonna be rigorous about putting compression on. And I'm gonna make sure that, you know, if I you know, break my leg, that my husband or my, my kids know how to do this or the barn owner knows how to do it. Patient compliance in human lymphedema is 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 ninety five percent of it, um, and that's the hard thing for owners. You know, busy. We're all busy, you know, but you know the extra care and attention that it takes to manage a horse with a lymphatic problem is real. We have to realize that there's a time and economic cost to that, and and you know we have to make decisions accordingly. But you know the people, the people that get on top of it quickly are the ones where their horses just improve. And, and that is across the board in humans and horses. That's just the bottom line. If you're gonna do one thing, do it. That's it, <laughs> that's a, you know, do it. Because without doing it, you're going downhill. You've got yeah. to do it to stop the progression. That's, that's just how it goes. I can absolutely attest to that. Uh, Rebecca and I were talking before the webinar that, um, and I have to say hello to Hannah, if she's ever watches this, uh, Hannah, in the uh, CPL Facebook group has just been a wealth of information and support for, for all of us that are dealing with horses with CPL. But at the foundation, we manage a number of horses that have CPL. And once we discovered Hannah and uh, we got information from her and found the right uh, protocol to manage these horses, I have to say, you know, we'll never be able to reverse the damage that's already been done to the lymphatic system. You know, the fibrosis sits in there, but our horse's legs look as good as they're ever going to look. So yeah. if you're, if you're dealing with CPL on a horse, I can absolutely attest to what she's saying is that the management, you, you can absolutely um, do the best you can and, and definitely improve the quality of the legs as far as the secondary issues and the health of the skin. Oh, definitely. And sometimes, you know, in a horse with very heavy he feather, just getting the feather up and off and just being able to get the air to it, you know, it can help it quite enormously. But another thing, if, if, we ca if you catch this early, if you suddenly think, I think this has got early CPL, if you then do compress and get on top of it, you can roll it back. It just takes a little time. So mm -hmm. let's say you're in a CPL score, you know, B, um, and you're in compression, you can get that back to an A. Um, you know, that's not a problem. It's just when you're at the far end, you know, when you're in CPLD, where you've got massive gross malformation, you know, like 
and then it becomes much much harder to to wing it back but i'm so heartened now here in the uk again thanks to hannah's help on the day-to-day -day care of these horses that you we're getting people like a couple of years ago you know we were just always getting the end cases but now because awareness is so good that people are picking up the tiniest skin fold and saying it's a cpl <laughs> and you know what it's fantastic because as soon as you see that if you input if you put your protocol in and decent compression that horse can stay like that forever you know it, yeah it doesn't have to get worse it doesn't have to get worse and and, and early diagnostics is vital 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 the more that everyone knows the more that everyone can talk about the more that everyone can send pictures into you know hannah's page and get proper advice and follow everything there that the, the, the easier it is these horses are not going to you know progress to these horrendous levels you know that we see and that's the main thing you know education is everything my job in this world really is to is to get everything in my brain and my experience out to you guys you know it really is because i can't i can't do it like i'm a one person and seven billion in you know planet town you know i mean dead <laughs> you know, come on i mean you know you you all have to get out there too and start talking to people and say yeah i think this is cpl and then get on there and and like you say just get on and do it and you know you can you can you can pull it back as, as angie said you can pull it back pretty pretty and sometimes pretty amazingly you know yeah just fantastic let me just see um whether i've got any more oh yeah so we'll carry on here um so basically, this is like everything that we've looked at really has been, uh, you know, how it all works, how it all gets put together, how we define the disease, how we how we tell what the stages of the disease. And so I know it's been a little bit human based, but you can't really understand the, the next section unless you've you know done the, the first section. But, you know, looking at um, disease, lymphedema in animals, you know, we, we're in a, a real back step here, you know, like we're, we're still bad on humans, to be honest, there's still uh, old people in nursing homes, you know, with lymph pouring out of their legs, and nobody's doing anything about them, you know, they are just a, a forgotten generation of lymphatic sufferers, and it's much nicer to see the younger kids coming through now googling, <clears throat> And getting good information and demanding treatment because you know in the uk it's been absolutely abysmal it's been completely underfunded you know really terrible terrible problems um and you know we used to think that lymphedema was way more prevalent in humans because you know we think oh our humans stand up right so we've got more gravity you know against us and everything but actually no the more we're looking at it the more we're realizing the problem in animals is way bigger than we ever thought because the vets don't look at it nobody looks at it and they see anything a bit odd um, a lot of animals are euthanized, um, you know, the, the, the cases aren't investigated by anybody that knows anything about it, um, you know, so we just don't know, you know, and we know that we see a lot of primary lymphedema in cows, pigs, sheep, dogs, horses, you know, it is everywhere. Um, and, and we just don't know what the figures are, sadly, I mean, it's really quite scary actually and and when we look back at that first question you know do, you know how many horses have lymphatic problem and i said to you well then actually any horse that's standing in a stable has a lymphatic problem <laughs> to a varying degree it gets a bit scary and then you look at cows that are just standing in you know lots all day or you know pigs that are just in tiny containers and you think well actually yeah there, there, there is a much bigger problem than we think there is so it's a hidden disease it's a disease that that is not recognized as under recognized under diagnosed and, and and i suspect you know the true figures would be fairly horrifying yeah horrifying any questions on that one? Yeah, so there's a, it's kind of a comment too, but um, the fact that, and I'm sure it's the same in the UK as it is here, but it, it, it seems to be the case that your normal, your average vet that might come out to your house to do vaccinations for your horse or, or, or do an ambulatory call, they're not well-versed in CPL. And so um, it's just, it's more of a comment than a question. And I'm sure you guys deal with that there, but um I guess that just underscores the fact that as owners, um, you know, the knowledge is starting to become more prevalent. And even if our vets aren't well-versed, yeah. you know, we yeah. can- Yeah, and we'll cover that a little bit more in the in the next session, because there's like a bit of hope now, really, in a way, because like, we've devised a, a vet course so that the, the vets have to come onto our site and do a, 
is free, you know, counts towards their continuing professional development. If they want to prescribe the products, they have to do the information because there's no point sending a vet out with a product that they don't know anything to do about the disease, you know? Um, and so what I think will happen is um, we've got six to eight horse, uh, six to eight vets going through at the moment, just checking the course, seeing that they like it, checking that they, they understand it. <clears throat> and as soon as they've gone through that, they'll be certified so that owners can then look at the website and okay. say, right, where's the nearest vet that actually knows what the bloody hell they're doing? Sorry, that's English swearing for you there. <laughs> but, you know, that's um, doesn't count over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, um, you know, and then, and then hopefully those vets will start to get inundated with people. Likewise, owners that think, right, I need that product, they can go onto the website and they will be able to send an invite over to their vet saying, you know, hi, oh, okay. Angie has this horse. She's really interested in this. She wants you to prescribe this. Will you please do this course to certify it and get it done? Okay. So therefore, hopefully the whole standard and the bar of veterinary education will increase because they will have diagnostics and because they will be able to actually do something. And we've literally made um, uh, tissue quality blocks so that they're made, we've made them out of artificial skin, you know, oh, so wonderful. You can press each block, you can slide each block and then they can go to the leg and they can go, okay, that's oh, you know, wow. one out of five there or five out of five there. They've got the measurements, they can put it into the app the app will say you need to, you know, you need to do this for this long and you need to do that. And if you've got any problems, okay. then, you know, sort it out. So hopefully, you know, we could, this will be coming up in the new year and also owners will be able to put all of their measurements and, and, and press and stretch tests into the site so that they can see how their horse is progressing. The site should be able to predict where that horse should be in the future. We can get some data from it so we can start to look at, you know, getting decent mm -hmm. science out of this and learn more about it. And also oh. if the horse's legs go up in volume, the owner and the vet will get an amber alert to their email or to their oh, phone good. to say, what's going on? Is there an infection here? Do you need to take, you know, emergency action? You know, have you not put your compression on? And then in the future, we'll stick, um, we'll, we'll have like a turnout compression with step counters. So you can see that your horse is getting the, oh, the, the most amount of, yeah, yeah. Wow. All coming. So are we gonna, yeah, okay. look at these eye bags though. This is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Will we go into uh, more detail about about that in um part in the next, of the series? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then I will um just okay. Uh, hang on a minute, just flip And will that, will that service, those classes be uh, something that our vets here in America could sign up to do and they could- Oh yeah, yeah, you've got a couple of American vets going through it right now and a couple of- Do we? Well, that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My vet is about to get a call. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, to be honest, um, what I'm doing is I'm feeding them the modules in draft format in return for feedback. Okay. Feedback um that they give me um what it basically means that they'll just get certified through so mm -hmm. if you know of a vet that's keen to learn just just email me absolutely and we'll i'll put them on the list and i'll send them the modules as well because they might as well kind of like pre-train through it mm -hmm. um and then you know we, we we we've got them working then haven't we which is good <clears throat> right. which be nice so basically, when we look at primary lymphedema in horses, you know, remember I said that in human primary lymphedema, we're looking at a lot of gene problems, genetic problems. And um, they found a few things, but kind of quite not a lot. They found that um, there are there are fewer anastomoses, which are basically connections, pipe like, you know, lymphatic vessel connections between um, the subfascial collectors in affected horses than other healthy horses. Now I have my, a, a little bit of doubt on this because uh, yeah, I think it, I think it's, it, it probably is happening. So we can see that, you know, they're starting to look about, you know, which part of the system is failing here. Uh, the truth is that they don't really know right now. Um, but I think as gene, uh, genetic, um, you know, research starts to happen a bit more, which is really being done by the breed societies. So the Belgian draft society did quite right. a lot, done quite a lot on this because of course they're really worried because they're thinking, well, you know, geez, can we actually breed from this stallion? Are we, you know, are we sending this degree, you know, so we, we really do need to know this. 
Um, so they're, they're looking around, they're, they're trying to see what the hell's going on. But the sad thing that's really annoying me is that they are, the vets have kind of run away with it on their own and haven't really consulted with people that have been working in the field of human lymphedema for many years, you know, since the 1950s. And there's a wealth of information in, in human, but the vets seem to just sort of like, they're not really taking very much of it. They're not really, they're, they're not really, there's not a lot of, of, of linking between the two and they're, they're really missing things. So for example, UC Davis will say things like, you know, to diagnose lymphedema, you have to do like an X-ray or a double, a double punch biopsy. And we're like, geez, you know, all of our human, we're like, you kidding me? You don't need yeah. to do that. Why go through that extra expense? It's, it's contraindicated. You don't need to know. Um, and, and then, but, but then again, I can understand it in the sense that people, you know, if, if you haven't learned press and stretch and to take your measurements, you don't know what you're doing, then the only way you can see if that leg is getting worse or better is by x-ray, right? So right. You know, at the moment we're in this kind of, you know, which system is going to win here, but I, I think we'll get there in the end. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be a lot cheaper for everyone as well. We've well, that makes sense though, what you're saying that, you know, the diagnostic tools, the veterinarians are using that. They haven't they haven't uh they haven't used the resources from human lymphology to to make things a little easier yeah them. and part of that is that everybody working in lymphedema will have phenomenally amazingly trained hands you know yeah. my fingers have, have touched I don't know, thousands of people, thousands of horses. And so, so I just do that and go, oh, yeah, that's that. You know, it's easy for me, but it isn't easy for anybody else. Right, right. And this is one of the problems. You know, they, they can rely on an x-ray or a biopsy in a way, but they, because, because hands are subjective. Hence, we, we, we have a thing called a durometer, which is actually a hardness tester, where you can take, actually test the hardness of tissue. But it, but it really is, lymphedema is those three things. It's the measurements of the leg, i.e. the volume, the size of the leg. And everyone focuses on that because, you know, we all can handle a measuring tape. But it's also the quality of the tissue. So how it, the press test, if the pitting oedema is soft, that's good. You can move it. If the pritting edema is hard, that's harder. You need more pressure, longer time. If the stretch test, if it's nice and loose and it's moving, ooh, good, early stage. You know, we don't need a lot of pressure here. We don't need a lot of time. That's great. If that thing's hardly moving at all and it's feeling like a, you know, a log, then you think, oh my God, you know, now we've got, you know, we've got to adapt the treatment for that because that's harder. But of course, that's all kind of subjective. How, how can how can everybody be singing off the same hymn sheet? Hence the, the the little things of artificial skin, you know, that goes some way to help them. And then they can stick the durometer up and down. And then we can have a nice graph and saying, well, you know, here's the tissue quality and here's the actual the, the calibrated machine and they're they you know they're, they're actually you know yes this works but it's not till you've done that a lot <laughs> before the health right this and so that ex that explains why the average vet that only has maybe a handful of draft horses that have cpl in their practice they yeah. just don't have enough clinical experience with it no no they wouldn't do um they wouldn't do not to their not to their fault or anything like that but it's just no and also bear in mind angie there's no products really <clears throat> there aren't any good ones i mean well there are there are products i mean some some of the eight ones can be okay for the early early stage of the disease but you know as i'll say in the next section you know bad compression is is worse than no compression if you're not sure of doing it right you shouldn't be doing it um, and, and everyone goes, woohoo, look at these bandages. Yeah, that's great. We can bandage away. But actually, if you're doing it wrong, it's worse. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of scarily bad. Um, any questions on that bit? No questions at the moment. Oh, wait. I just got one. Um, oh, here we go. I have, okay. This is from Diane. She says, I have a 24 year old that has had on and off swelling up his knee, up to his knee on occasion that seemed to start as mud fever or scratches on his white heel bulb. Would that be considered CPL? He does stock up in his stall as well. Yeah, is that, that, is that, that one hind? Did she say? Uh, both hinds. She has, on one. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it could either be two things. It could either be the CPL, well, primary lymphedema in both legs, but one's got an infection and it's made that one leg worse, or 
he's, it looks like secondary uh, lymphedema where, you know, you've got one leg that's worse than the other. And uh, yeah, that, that's most probably it, probably from repeated infection. She said, thank you, that's what she thought. Yeah, yeah, no worries. If, if you want to, if anybody wants to, if they've got a problem with the horse, then just literally email me and, and send me some pictures. And you know, Angie, I think you've got my email address, but if you- I do, yeah. I'll, I'll, when we send finish up here tonight. Yeah, send it through. So chronic progressive lymphedema, they, they now grade it A, B, C, D. Um, of, the, of course, the charts that we had for humans don't match the ones for horses, but hey-ho. Starts off just with, you know, little bulges, little things. It gets worse and worse as it carries on. You know, you start to get problems with the hoof. You start to get problems, even if the volume's not that big and the skin folds and the nodules, like the second picture on the right, you can still get problems in, in, in between the folds, especially in muddy conditions, as we all know. Oops. Um, this picture is interesting in the sense that you would say that these two horses were at the same level, maybe a late B, early C, <clears throat> or as you can see, one is now very nodule, you know, it's got a lot of nodules on it, the little kind of pea-sized and bigger lumps, whereas the horse on the right tends to have much more of those ridgy folds, so it's the hyperkeratosis and the skin thickening. And what's interesting to me about these is people need to know the difference, well, <laughs> you've got the same disease going on but one horse with the nodules is pretty much indicative to me that it's had mites mite right. infestation, and that those nodules are like classically mighty i call them um and these can get as i was saying to angie before this session these can get pretty scarily awful and I have come across horses where they just look absolutely riddled with these things and where the vets have been telling the owners to put them down now don't freak out about these because don't forget that the horse can can suffer quite extensive damage superficially to the skin because they can send the lymph deep much better than we can and so quite often in horses like this you know the superficial thing is going on but so long as the leg isn't filling and getting bigger it's okay the leg is draining don't panic you know support the horse yes because it's it's, it's superficial, it's damaged. So it's literally sending everything to the deep. So, you know, you want to support that the best you can, but it's not curtains for the horse, not at all. Um, and of course, this other horse here, I mean, okay, it's not clipped as well, but doesn't have any nodules at all. Never had a mite problem, but it does have skin folds and, and that kind of thing going on. So, you know, bear in mind, and, and, and the second horse on the, on the right will, in my opinion, be slightly worse than the nodules because to get skin folds when they start to get harder when you feel the nodule leg in between the nodules it's usually quite soft and movable yeah. and pliable whereas in the in the second horse um, you you know you see the skin folds are often not that pliable anymore and the general rule of lymphedema is if it's soft and the skin and everything's moving you can move it you can improve it the more hardened it is, or what we call indurated, or the, the, the more fibrotic the leg, the harder it is. And, and you see that in human medicine, you can have two humans coming in, one with an absolutely enormous leg where all the students panic because they think, oh my God, it's so enormous, but it's lovely and fluidy, you know, and you can pretty much pull that back with no problem. And, um, and then you can get a smaller leg, but you touch it and it's extremely fibrotic and you think, yeah, you're not going to get much out of that anymore. And that's where, you know, if you can feel that press and stretch test and you can get in there early, you can you can improve it. You know, the worst thing you want to do with lymphedema is let it go hard. The harder it is, the, the you know, the less chance you have. Um, so generally speaking, nodules, you would see more with mites. And generally speaking, if you were going to have one or the other, you would you would generally prefer the nodules to the skin folds. Yeah, I would. Yeah, personally. I mean, of course, it's slightly swings around about because sometimes nodules can hide a lot. You know, bear in mind as well that I treated a horse once actually was a secondary and I, I very casually went in there and thought, wow, this is an easy case. You know, that should reduce with compression bandaging in six days. You know, we'll be fine. And that thing did not go down. And I thought, oh, <laughs> this is bad. 
And we went down very, very, very slowly. And I was thinking, God, you know, these poor owners are obviously thinking that they've, they've hired me and I'm a complete idiot. And um, I was waking up at night thinking, God, you know, am I an idiot? Have I, have I completely messed up here? But what happened when on about day nine was this, this, this scar that had been completely hidden revealed oh, itself. Oh. and we thought that's what it was <laughs> so always bear in mind you know horses cheese you know they under nodules and skin folds a lot can be hidden a lot that is a true statement <laughs> yeah 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 you know just getting wrapped in wire or you know kicked as a bowl you know like a contusion you know, can can really and even um ovarian cyst operations oh my god yeah a lot of lymphedema in those because the operation site is right near the iliacal node group, which takes all the lymph from the lower legs. So, you know, mares that have had ovarian cyst removals are very, very prone to lymphedema when they're older because of scar tissue contractions. Very, very interesting. But always with horses, assume they've got scars somewhere because <laughs> they usually do. And some of them can be really badly hidden and you don't know what the hell's going on. And sometimes it's just a confusing mess and you just, you just have to do the best you can because we can't see inside them. So it's interesting anyway. Um, then we get um, other things going on. So this is a little horse I saw the other day with Hannah, actually, who Hannah was, came out with me, which is really lovely. Um, and this is a, um, other things that can happen. So other growths. like right. sort of I have seen this in, in, I would have seen several Frisian cases of this. Yeah. I yeah. Think it's very scary for the owner and it's also confusing Quite for the pets. Yeah, and quite often the vets don't know, they can't recognize the difference between a nodule and, and CPBT, especially in the early stages. When they're lucky, they're quite pink and um, warty looking, you know, right. um, as compared to a, nod a CPL nodule, which tends to be, you know, different like the other right, one. Pretty, yeah. These are not death sentences either. I mean, of course, you know, you've got to look at, you know, what's going on in the foot you know have they you know if they got everything aligned properly you need you need a very good farrier for stuff like this because often then by then you know they can't flex through the mm -hmm. through the fetlock joint and, and things get a bit funny and of course these the cppd nodules can press against um bone and cause side bone and other things so in these cases we tend to say you know x-ray because it has a big bearing on you know long-term treatment outcomes and 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 what we do in these things when we're not quite sure is is we build it up we say okay well we can pad that out we can compress but start off two hours at a time so it's two hours see how it is then next time four hours see how it is and then eventually you get up to you know eight nine hours then you know that that horse can tolerate that in a stable overnight you're not going to have a problem but sometimes when you got arthritis it's so difficult you have to do this long build-up because you have to know you know if you've got two arthritic joints that are crashing against each other and then you put compression on those joints can mash against each other and they could just a lot of pain and we, we don't want to do that to our horses but you know but this little guy you know he's he's doing really well and well you know considering this is a bad case um you know so so don't ever lose hope there's there's always stuff that can often be done but being as as angie's always said you know keeping on top of it and knowing what the hell is underneath it and document 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 photograph 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 and one of the things that also i started and encouraged people to do and i need to sorry hannah i haven't given you the forms but i will do i promise um is to say look we can't look at all of the nodules on a leg but we can choose one nodule on on each leg and we can measure it and we can photograph it and we can press into it and we can feel it and then every six months just do a little assessment how does that nodule look has it has it got better has it got softer has it got smaller you know that's the type of thing that that we need to do so you know it goes back to the compliance thing the more on the ball you are the more you know how your horse's legs look but also feel um and you record that photograph it the better you, you know you know you know where you are um which is really important to the management of the disease because you need to know as soon as that you know if you've got them in compression and it's really really you know holding nicely you want to cat if it's going to go down you want to catch it early you know you don't want to catch it while it's down here so yeah that's uh yeah as i said a few things about diagnostics that 
generally from human lymphedema, we, I don't really even say this for horses to do. I'm not really that bothered about x-ray imaging unless you're really trying to see how fast the rate of progression is. That's fine. Double bunch biopsies, I don't really recommend because, you know, like, what's the point? It's a, you can, you can see what's going on. You can feel what's going on. Why, why put your horse through, you know, a potential risk of secondary infection? And then um, we've come into the secondary lymphedema in horses, which is where, as we were saying before, you've usually got one hind limb affected. So this is not inherited. This is lymphedema, same, but it's different. So it's usually as a result of infection trauma or um, lymphangitis or cellulitis. This is affecting the horses that are spending formative years standing still on restricted movement. This is the picture that is really good because you can see the dye here in these in the vessels at the bottom. You see how they're all at the bottom. Is that, is that a, like a venogram? Yeah, it's a lymph lymphocytography. They're literally putting um, dye in the contrast medium into the lymphatics. It's wow. flowing through. But if you look at the bottom of the of the lymphatic vessel, you see how it's thicker and it's all concertinaed, and that's where it's all blocking and not getting up. And these were these young horses that are telling you about them standing still. So you know these are not CPL horses. These are not ancient horses these are fairly young horses that nobody knew had a problem and they found um they found congestion in the collector vessels despite no sign of oedema externally yeah it all goes on underneath the skin when we don't even see it that is the proof um so it's really interesting and the whole subfascial collector system gets obstructed and we know, and that's the area where horses get mud fever uh, and passen dermatitis. It's because the lymphatics aren't working properly. And, you know, the whole area is compromised. So infection gets in and it all gets really gungy and yucky. And that's why it's happening. You can't see any lymphedema from the outside, but on the inside, you've got it. And that's pretty much to some varying degree in pretty much every horse that's stabled, which is quite profound, really. Um, I mean, they might only have it a tiny bit, but it's quite interesting. Um, these are kind of things that they can look like. This is secondary lymphedema. Um, so the first one, uh, I think it was a 21-year-old mare. She's a lovely mare, great owner. You can see the um, rub wounds on the front of the fetlock joint where people have been trying to compress it incorrectly. And that horse, I think, started off about 90% and um, went all the way through her life at minus 2%. <laughs> the owner got it lower than the other leg. It was amazing. Wow. Then, yeah, yeah. You can, you can get it down. This one was 156% bigger than the other leg. So it's probably one of the worst cases I've come across. And you can see the lymphorrhea here, you know, and you can see the scar tissue further up just above um, sort of like you know, the gasket here where you can see the scar tissue where it's all um, burst open, the skin can burst open. You can see the beginning of the delamination of the hoof wall here. It's nasty, nasty stuff. But you can do a lot with it. Um, and we'll see how we treat things like that in the next session. Oops. Yeah. So, so this one went down. I think we got this from 156 to 30%. Not ideal. I'd love to have got it down lower, but you know, down down to that level is not that bad for for a leg that big that's been you know had so much damage. And these horses just suffer so badly. I mean, this is the these infections are nasty, and and they'll affect the whole horse. And you know, it, it, the horses are just so unwell, and it it is ugh, you know you just your heart bleeds for them really. Um, but you can do a lot. And next session, I'll show you what we do with both of them so that you know how to how to do it so that's the end of our session i'm sorry we've run over terribly but um hopefully that's that okay be... that's why <laughs> right. we plan for this to be a two-part series because as we can see it, it just takes a while to get through all of them. so if i'll give a few uh, seconds here if you have a question um please put it into the question and answer box um other than that our next webinar the part two the really exciting part i think everybody is <laughs> here is how do you manage this how do you treat it
Um, and I think you guys will find that part now that you under, you understand the lymphatic system and what's going on here with lymphedema, that part will be very informative. So that those are the golden nuggets that we we want you to take and spread um, throughout the Frisian community. So I don't have any more questions, so I will go ahead and close. At first, I want to thank you, Rebecca. This was amazing. I, I, we've been waiting for like a year and a half to do this webinar, the Education oh. Committee at FANA. We've been searching for the right person to present and we're so grateful that we had you. Um, Jennifer's asking when the next webinar will be. Um, oh, um, I'm sorry, I do have a question here. I'll ask it really quick. Karen wants to know, is this a cause or effect or both with scratches? So which comes first? chicken or the egg yeah um so in england we call it well scratches we call some mud fever here and it's a really interesting question because um i think it uh, well i would i would pretty much put my money on it is definitely a lymphatic problem um and what's really interesting in this and it goes into a whole other subject of wound healing but it's interesting anyway and 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 i'm really happy to share it with you because it's something that i always really enjoy very much but also it's great to understand it is that if you have a, um, a lymphatically compromised leg basically going back to the washing up bowl analogy instead of a clear gel that can you know everything can move through nicely you're now getting oatmeal of various hardnesses and so if you're a little cell in there you're not getting the nutrients and the oxygen you need to stay up to optimum health OK, so that's what's happening under the skin of these areas. OK, you're getting immunologically compromised and because because you're not getting the nutrients and oxygen, it's like us trying to live on, you know, half oxygen and only eating, you know, like cardboard or whatever. But um, so when you have a healthy leg or a healthy body, let's say my hand, cut my hand, I'm fairly healthy you'll get biological stability of the skin within you know, a few days and then everything will knit and heal together because you know everything can come up and the waste can be taken away. And wound healing is interesting because when this wound is healing on a healthy hand, I have to be careful with my hand not to let my hand get too wet because if I dunk my hand in the bath and then I take my hand out, you'll see that the scar will go all like yellow and manky and a bit pussy and horrible. And then as it, as it dries, it goes back to normal. Now that has a term that's called wound maceration. And that basically means that you've got the wound bed too wet. OK, the other thing I need to watch out, especially if my wound has gone over a finger, is that my skin doesn't get too dry. Because as soon as I move my hand, the cup that's dry will split open again, much the same way as a split lip. You smile and it cuts open. And what the difficulty with that is, well, both of them, maceration being too wet and, you know, when it's starting to split and feel like, you know, sand crystals, you know, sort of, um, you know, sugar or salt crystals, you know, that kind of like, dry mud fever type of thing is basically it's the same problem you've got a wound but it's either going too wet or too dry now when you want to heal a wound you want it to hit a sweet spot in the middle because it's healing while it's in this zone but if it goes too high up here and too wet it stops healing Ooh, that's mm. quite profound if it goes too dry it stops healing now the way to, um, and that's not so bad in a healthy hand because, you know, your body will just kind of adapt and it will kind of get there in the end. But when you've got lymphedema, you've got all the underlying tissue is not optimum. So your wound healing, instead of it, you know, knitting together in three days, you're now looking at a much longer time, okay? A lot longer. My first human patient, was about to have his leg amputated because of a non-healing wound that he'd had for 18 months. Now, nobody had diagnosed an underlying lymphatic condition. That's why that wound did not heal. That's why they were going to chop his leg off. This is not back in the 1800s. This was 15 years ago in the United Kingdom. 
you know, this is basic stuff that we should really know, but that we don't. Now, you know, when you have delayed or poor wound healing, you're looking at longer time frames. Now, in a longer time frame, it's going to be really, you know, you're going to have to hit that sweet spot quite well for that wound to heal. And of course, the trouble with horses, <laughs> you know, if we've got rain and mud and we've got everything, you know, or we've got, you know, fields that have got lovely sea breezes so that they get quite dry and they split open. So there's no one size fits all for scratches or mud fever. You're looking at a wound that's either wanting to bounce between being too dry and too wet. And then you have to make the choice because it's not like you're going to do the same thing every day. Um, if the wound looks like it's going all yellow and manky and too wet, you want to allow it to dry a little bit. Now that might be bringing your horse in or putting a, um, a wrap around it to stop the water getting to it or whatever, whatever. But you don't want to put oil on that like at all, because all you're going to do is you're going to trap the moisture on the wound and you're going to end up being macerated for longer, which means your wound healing is going to take longer. Likewise, if your wound is getting dry and cracky and you think, oh, crikey, if the fetlock moves, it's going to split open, um, it's dry. Oh, OK, now you need your creams and stuff in there because you don't want that to get too dry. So you're always trying to hold that wound in that optimum level. Now, if you add compression, um, all of the gunky waste material goes out all of the new blood and oxygen comes in, you've got beautiful climate for healing, again, it heals much faster. So if you have mud fever, you generally find, and I've seen it with scratches, I've seen it a lot, huge amount around here, obviously, because we're in a muddy island in the middle of the Atlantic. But, you know, if you put, I've seen it where it's so bad, you know, like people have, you know, just distraught. Um, and we've put um, wound dressings on, we've, put compression on and literally 24 hours later, you take the compression off and the skin is all healthy, it's all pink, it's healing. It's just a lovely thing, but it is our responsibility in a way to understand what's happening underneath and then choose the appropriate things to do to ensure that we're hitting that spot in the middle and then we're we're, we're, you know, instead of allowing it to go on for three months, we're, we're sort of compacting. And this is the trouble with scratches. They should know that with chronic pastin dermatitis, that this is happening, but they don't. And companies don't care because they just want to sell you more products. And the vets don't know because nobody knows about lymphatics. It's so frustrating. <laughs> but the good thing is, as you know now, <laughs> so, you know, that that's the way. So quite often when you're looking at a CPL leg, you've got a number of things going on. You might have um, in a fold a, um, um, a fungal or a bacterial infection, in which case you'll need flamazine or whatever. You might have clipped the leg, so you've got no protective oil, so you're going to need skin emollient to go in. But you also might have a wet bit by the bulb of the heel, so you want to kind of dry that bit if you can a little bit. So you're, you're trying to balance different needs of skin, you know, wherever they are. And that is hard, don't, you know, even I do this all the time and I find it hard, you know, and Hannah's page is very good for that because she, she completely understands that that does happen and finding the right thing. But the general rule of thumb is if it's yellow and manky and pussy looking, let it dry a bit. If it's all splitting open and it's all crusty and dry, you know, emoliate it more, you know, and then you'll, you'll get better, you'll get better wound healing in, in scratches and, and what we call mud fever or chronic, um, uh, chronic pastin dermatitis. Yeah, it's a good question. Really good question. That was fascinating. And I'm, I'm yeah. glad I, I'm glad I added <laughs> that before we closed out because I've never seen it. I've never heard anyone describe the balance of wet and dry like that with scratches and, and how yeah. to. It's the same thing you've got a wound in a bad cellular environment. Right. That's it. And, and it will swing depending on the external environment between too wet and too dry. That's what's going on. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Well, so we will go ahead and close it out. And I promise everyone before the next webinar, which is the second part, and that'll be on October 14th at 5 p.m. Eastern time here in the U.S. So put that on your calendars. I will also 
um, get together the various um, links to Rebecca's website, Equilymph, and um, the uh, website that Hannah's put together about CPL, and then also the link to the Facebook group about CPL as well. So I'll make sure we have those ready for you guys once we talk about how to treat and manage this. Um, again, I want to thank Rebecca. This was, was absolutely exceeded our expectations. I can say that for sure. And on behalf of the Fenway Foundation for Frisian Horses, our sponsor, um, we thank you all for attending tonight's webinar. If you have any additional questions, please submit them to us at fauna at fauna.com and we will link you up with Rebecca. We'll get those emails over to her uh, for a good response. And uh, this webinar was recorded uh, and it will be added to Fauna's library. You can find all of Fauna's uh, educational webinars right on our homepage on the landing page. Just look for that icon that says webinar. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Rebecca. And we will Thank see you, you so all much, everybody. Great on question. the 14th. Take care. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.